This is pretty crazy today. We sent a CPU to a failure analysis lab to learn why it might have exploded and what the aftermath was. This is the process of a failed AMD 7800X 3D getting acoustically scanned with a non-destructive technique allowing us to see what the internal defects of the chip might be. The CPU also got x-rayed to show us what might have gone wrong while also being microscoped to reveal how the substrate exploded outward when the CPU failed. We were also able to see the internal solder application to reveal voids, plus energy dispersive x-ray to reveal more about the material properties. And finally, the failure analysis lab we sent this to cross-sectioned the CPU in sectioning epoxy to get as close as possible to the point of failure. And this is one of the coolest videos we've ever made. It's the follow-up to part one, where we were able to successfully reproduce a failure seen on Reddit, where a motherboard and a CPU mutually incinerated. And that's already live, so you should check it out if you haven't seen it. It gives all of the foundation for this one. This one, though, focuses on looking at the damage signature of a CPU. And our next one, the final one in this series, we'll talk about Asus and our many problems with how they've handled this. But today, it's more of an objective focus and less rage. Before that, this video is brought to you by Warframe and its brand new update, the Duviri Paradox. The newest update makes it easy for returning players to jump in right away with tons of new content, but also adds a path for new players to start out. These updates go beyond just cosmetics and quality of life changes. There are tons of new elements to the game and a completely unique, massive new open world to explore. And for action RPG or third person shooter and slasher fans, Warframe is worth the free download to put your gaming PC to work. The new update features a new cinematic quest alongside highly replayable roguelite missions. A few of us on the team at GN play Warframe and like the game, so it was a natural sponsor fit. Check out Warframe The Duviri Paradox at the link below and use the code on the screen for extra unlocks. We're extremely excited about this content today because we get to learn about hardware failures at a depth we rarely get to encounter. So we expedited a shipment of a burned motherboard and CPU over to the same failure analysis lab that we worked with for the NVIDIA 12 volt high power failures. So they've got some experience working on this stuff now. And there's a few parts to failure analysis in general. So namely, for what we're doing, there's root cause analysis. That's what our team did here, where we were able to more or less determine a few likely uh, reasons, the root cause of failures that we've seen online. And then another part is sort of a post-mortem. When we were doing root cause analysis originally, we found a couple points of failure in voltages and the OCP, or the overcurrent protection that was configured on the motherboard, alongside considerations of shortcomings on the overtemperature protection mechanisms. And you can support our root cause analysis and content production by grabbing one of these super limited GN15 shirts celebrating our 15th anniversary over on store.gamersnexus.net. They have a super vibrant blue foil along with a gold foil for the 15. And on the back, there's a subscriber graph as we ascend towards 2 million subscribers. These always sell through really quickly whenever we do a limited edition shirt. So we expect these to be gone within a few weeks and it directly funds the massive effort that we've had to put in for this specific series of three parts of content. So if you like this kind of work and you want a cool limited shirt in return to commemorate 15 years, support us and get something nice, then head over to store.gamersnexus.net. So the next part of failure analysis is more of an internal look. It looks structurally and electrically at what could have possibly gone wrong. And our team currently can't do this. We don't have the tools. So we send the parts out to an external professional lab that's able to assist with this type of testing. And that lab does validation and FA of failed semiconductors and other equipment that we can't get into. These labs use a mix of specialized equipment to first perform non-destructive testing, which is necessary to preserve the integrity of the failure. And then they advance to destructive testing, which you can't go back from to double check their hypotheses. This lab we work with does phenomenal work. And to the failure analyst engineer watching, our sincere thank you for your patience and all of your effort into this. Unfortunately, we can't name the lab or the engineer for reasons which we also can't name. But on behalf of the community, we all appreciate the ability to bring this type of information to the public eye instead of letting it just get sort of hidden and then a silent update fixes it in the future. In this case, really loud update because they were exploding. But Oh, it's on fire. Yeah, I can smell it. OK, as we get into it, here's what we have. Acoustic scan imaging, an EDS, or Energy Dispersive X-ray Spectroscopy, SEM, examination or scanning electron microscopes, cross sections. We have the acoustic scanning while the CPU is submersed in water. We have a scan of substrate connections, 
a low mag polarized optical and where we can see the exploded substrate where it's cracked. And we also have a CT scan showing us the pyrolyzed materials. We'll start with an external physical and visual inspection where we can look at the CPU like we did in the first video, but with a bit more depth. And in our first look, we talked about a low resistance short theory that may have led to the runaway scenario. Now, before getting to destructive delitting, looking this particular CPU and board over, we can quickly identify that the bottom of the substrate bulged outward as a result of a literal internal explosion. You can actually see where the substrate's starting to crack, and that explosion had enough force to suppress the underlying pins in the motherboard socket, resulting in the images we've all already seen. When we sent this initial information to our failure analyst contact, the analyst sent the following initial images, and this is all prior to us sending the sample out. Quote, over voltage could knock out a dielectric quickly, transient or longer term, time dependent dielectric breakdown. That would be what people mean when they say degradation. And with the interlevel dielectric degraded and some electrical leakage established, the resulting current could start causing permanent damage. The other EOS, or electrical overstress, possibility is overcurrent, where the current supplied exceeds the current carrying capacity of the metallization or to a point where the connected junction can no longer dissipate the power supplied. Of course, continued cycling of the device in this degraded state would exacerbate the damage observed. Each of these could have happened to get the damage we're seeing presently. You've reproduced one of those possibilities. Now, our first failure analysis test that the lab performed is CSAM, or C-Mode Scanning Acoustic Microscopy. And this one is helpful for determining if there's a defect in the solder application. So out of the factory from AMD, uh, is the solder defective to an extent that it would cause this failure? It's also very useful in determining if the die underneath the IHS is so cracked that pulling it apart would damage it to a point where we can no longer come to a conclusion as to what the failure is. So that's necessary just to know how to progress with the destructive testing. And this machine is super cool. The FA lab described this to us as a high frequency ultrasonic energy in excess of 20 kilohertz to non-destructively search for defects. For this test, the failed device is submerged in deionized water, which is necessary because ultrasound in excess of 10 megahertz can't propagate in air. Our contacts told us that the transducer array within the microscope is carefully selected to balance the spot size of the ultrasound with the penetration depth. In other words, using the finest detail spot size with 8.6 microns of resolution allows a better image, but 300 megahertz can't get through the IHS. The lab instead used a 50 megahertz transducer for this. The lab noted that this allowed them to see through the water, through the IHS, and the gold and indium interface under the IHS. The echo bounces off of these parts and an image is rendered of the internal components. That's what you're seeing now. Because this image stops before the silicon and the substrate, we're able to see the quality of AMD's solder application. But note that this is after the component failure. Here, we can see voids within the solder application for both the CCD and the IO die. The voids are indicated by the gaps within that yellow coloration within the black solder area. These voids could be a few different things. First, they could just be manufacturing defects, but these voids are acceptable manufacturing variants from what our FA lab contact tells us, and they're unlikely to be the cause for the CPU dying. We even noticed some in Jay's video when he mechanically delitted a CPU, no heat involved, that has similar voids. We've at least, in this case, ruled out voids as the cause for this CPU's failure. Secondly, they could be the result from over temperature of the CPU, wherein the solder liquefied or effectively desoldered itself and then rehardened. We found that AMD's indium solder solution cracks at about 158 degrees Celsius, and likely this is the point at which it becomes liquidous. An over temperature event would have happened as a result of the failure anyway, so we've effectively ruled out these two options as the actual cause. And that's the reality of a lot of what we're doing today. It's ruling things out to narrow in on the most likely possible cause for the failure. And maybe they'll point us towards the things we said in our first video, but it's important to get rid of some of those questions about could it be manufacturing variants or these other many things that it could possibly be. With the basic acoustic imaging complete, we can now move to some x-ray analysis. We have two types of scans here. One is a sort of normal two-dimensional x-ray like you might use to inspect someone's bone or something. And the other one is a 3D scan or computed tomography, commonly known as a CT scan. Same idea as in the medical world, we're just using them on different devices. So this is our first step towards destructive analysis because the thick metal IHS ended up actually interfering with the x-ray at all 
and thus it had to be removed to complete the testing. But the functional parts of the CPU are still intact, and the IHS was removed as delicately as possible to preserve the underlying damage. Along with acoustic scanning, this confirms that none of the silicon is completely smashed, which would make the next steps a lot more difficult. The x-rays reveal that some of the copper BGA bumps connecting the CCD to the substrate are melted. This is visible in the 2D images as dark specks between the regular circular bumps and the cylindrical vias. A 3D CT scan makes the problem much more obvious, with large gaps between the remaining bumps across the middle of the CCD. This is evidence of extremely high temperatures. For example, the melting point of copper, about 1,085 degrees Celsius, is much higher than that of any solder in the CPU. Interestingly, there was no evidence of similar damage underneath the I.O. dot. And this is interesting too, because in one of the CPUs we deleted, or actually a couple of them, the largest point of externally visible to the human eye damage was actually in the I.O. die in the GPU Phi, something we talked about the first time. Now we saw damage alongside and adjacent to the CCD, especially on the edges that are closest to the I.O. die, but with at least the samples we deleted previously, we couldn't see those large explosion marks or cracks forming that it looks like this sample might have. That doesn't mean that the failure type or cause is different, it just means that the way it manifested is different. You're talking about exploding silicon and melting it, potentially, so there's a lot that could go wrong in a lot of places. Now before getting to the scanning electron microscope, we next have a look at a, an extremely high magnification sort of normal microscope, and this one will give us a look at the silicon surface. This shot gives you an idea for just how deep the zoom goes. This AMD copyright mark, something we never knew even existed on the CPUs, is less than 60 microns wide. That's super cool that they even bother to do this. It's basically only for nerds who are inspecting it at this level. To get these shots, our contacts chopped off the half of the CPU containing the I.O. die, leaving the CCD side alone, and dissolved the substrate with fuming nitric acid, leaving just the clean I.O. die. In addition to silicon, that also includes the aluminum top layer and inner copper layer, still protected by the yellow-tinted silicon nitride glassification layer. Remember that this is flip-chip silicon. So the sort of top aluminum layer is the side that was originally face down against the substrate. The crazing on the surface is just the natural grain pattern of the aluminum layer. The large dark circles are where the BGA balls were before they were dissolved by nitric acid, while the smaller circles within the aluminum traces are connections running down into the copper layers. This is all fascinating, but it doesn't show us any problems yet. From our contact, quote, some etching defects are visible where the copper bumps terminated to the dye metallization, but no other issues are present. That's not to say that issues are not present under all the stacked metallization, but at this point we can rule out excessive electrical overstress for this specific I.O. dot. After the normal super high mag microscopy, we can now look at the scanning electron microscope. So SEM gives us two main points of detail for these CPUs. The first one that we're going to look at is EDS, or Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy. And the second one is High Resolution Imaging. EDS measures the wavelengths of x-rays emitted when the microscope's electron beam hits the sample, which can be mapped to specific elements. This should give us a better idea of what we're looking at as we examine black and white electron microscope images. Performing EDS on a cross-section of the CCD still mounted to its substrate gives us a colored dot map of the aluminum metallized silicon dye above an aluminum pad, which is in turn bonded to a copper bump. This is all public information that AMD has revealed. Our contact pointed out areas where copper reflowed, as well as flecks of, his words, insta-jibbed copper and silicon. Can't escape the quake references even in the failure analysis community. We can see the extreme heat this was subjected to. It's clear that it was a buildup as current continued to get shoved into the chip, not just an instantaneous shock and explosion. There's enough residue here and evidence from other imaging to know that the CPU became slowly overloaded and then effectively rapidly melted down. Finally, we're moving on to the cross section. This is still part of the SEM imaging that we've been talking about. So for this one, the failure analyst cross sectioned the silicon and mounted it in a section in epoxy, which keeps it all intact but allows a really close internal inspection that you can't see otherwise. And for this, the analyst noted that the plane of the section intersects the CCD and the blistered part of the LGA that we saw earlier, the land grid array on the bottom of the CPU. 
We'll start with some plain optical microscope shots just to get our bearings. The big rectangle on the top is the silicon dot, mounted in the lighter gray underfill that keeps it securely attached to the substrate underneath. Underneath that lies the substrate, which is a 525 stack, or five layers, power and ground planes, that's the two, and then five more layers. In the middle is a layer of fiberglass, crossed vertically by copper vias. That's the sort of tubes you can see running through it. The fiberglass core is pyrolyzed and delaminated, as are the layers of foil and the prepreg on the top of the chip and the bottom socket sides. We need to zoom in further to get to the source, though. Only the bottommost silicon is active. The rest is structural. That's where you see that sort of gray, inactive-looking material. The tiny reflective lines along the bottom edge of the die are the layers of metallization and glass evasion that we saw earlier. The glass evasion protects the silicon. At least, it protects it when you start dissolving the stuff around it, as we did earlier. The actual transistors here end up being too small to see. So this is the site of the biggest identifiable crack in the silicon. At the bottom of that crack, we can see the underfill has burned away from the silicon surface, and some of the high temperature solder connecting the die to the substrate has also melted away completely. It's genuinely insane to see this level of detail of a failure. It's crazy. It's, we're really privileged to be able to share this with you all and to have a contact with the equipment and the knowledge necessary to help us with all this. Further to the left, there's another burned site directly above the deformation in the substrate. The underfill is almost completely gone here. Still moving to the left, there's yet another burn. These multiple sites make it difficult to say where the failure was initiated, but we have some ideas and we'll kind of walk through those. We'll call these sites, sites 1, 2, and 3, numbered from left to right, with three being the one with the large crack. Now let's move back to the big boy microscope. Our contact described the SEM as, quote, an expensive light bulb. The analyst said, quote, our SEM is basically a cylindrical column containing a tungsten filament at the top and a sample chamber at the bottom. A massive potential of 20 kilovolts is created between the top column filament and the bottom of the chamber, which bleeds electrons down the column, striking the sample. Prior to inspection of the SEM, the cross-section CCD was coated in a 20 angstrom layer of gold to help with charge dissipation. Our contact continued and said when a sample is hit with an electron beam, a lot of cool things occur within a tear-dropped shape volume on the sample, called the interaction volume. Of the products generated, this analysis focused on two secondary electrons used for high-resolution imaging, and characteristic x-rays which were used for materials analysis. Now, for context, when the analyst here is talking about secondary imaging, what is really being referenced is submicron level images. So it's far beyond what the human eye could ever hope to see. And in the instances we're looking at here, beyond even what you would get realistically with a normal uh, microscope. Zoomed out, these images look just like the ones from the optical microscope, only black and white. Moving closer to site 2, though, we can now see delamination in the transparent layers of prepreg that's harder to pick out with a normal scope. We can also see the extent to which the underfill between the BGA balls was completely burned away. This area got hot. Here's a shot of what the connection between the dye and the substrate should mostly look like, far to the left of any explosions at all. That gives us some basis to understand. At the bottom of the frame are the upper five layers of copper from the 525 substrate sandwich. A substrate sandwich, by the way, the name of the new flagship sandwich at the GN Burger establishments. These five layers of copper carry signals from the socket. These layers are connected through the underfill with high temp solder to the copper BGA balls above, which contact the metallized parent die. Above that on the right is the 64 megabyte cache die, while the non-metallized rectangle on the left is structural. The line of erosion that we're seeing in the middle of the parent die layer shouldn't be there. And here's a closer shot. These are two dies. The 64 megabyte cache die is stacked on top of the parent die. From this perspective, the bottom layer is aluminum, followed by copper layers, the visible traces we saw earlier under the I.O. die, and above that are the actual transistors, still so tiny that they can't be seen. And then there's a thick layer of silicon substrate. The layer between the parent and the cache is pierced vertically by copper through silicon vias. The delamination here runs through the metallization layer of the parent die. Other than burned underfill, sites one and three look similar. 
Site 3 has the big, attention-grabbing silicon substrate crack, but the active silicon isn't that much worse here than it is elsewhere. Site 2 shows the area right above the exploded substrate. And that's where the gory details lie, the ones that'll get us demonetized. We can zoom in even closer, though. Here's an area where the delamination is so extreme that the metalized layers are bent out of shape. The die didn't split in half here, but the silicon of the parent die is cracked and crumbling. The real prize of this analysis is here, though. There's a clear evidence of the copper BGA bump melting away and immediately above a vertical crack through the parent die that appears to show melted silicon. If so, that would indicate temperatures of at least 1400 degrees Celsius. But we do know that this particular CPU at least was able to melt copper, which is still pretty damn hot. As for what all of this actually means, we have some ideas uh, working with the failure analyst to connect the points of where did the failure probably start and where did it end and all the points in between. And it's pretty detailed. First of all, just to recap what we've run through and what we've collected to come to the best conclusion we possibly can, given the amount of damage that affects our ability to inspect this further, uh, we've done external visual inspection, we've done radiographic inspection, so x-rays, we have at this point also done com computed tomography or laminography. We did uh, with the lab, of course, all this acoustic scans or C-mode scanning acoustic microscopy. And then uh, we also, with the FA lab, went through decapsulation of the IOC or the IO die, where it was sectioned and uh, isolated in some epoxy. There's a metallurgical cross section. There's EDS or energy dispersive x-ray and, uh, and then uh, some internal inspection of the CCD with a normal microscope and with a scanning electron microscope. So that's the testing that was done. And the root cause analysis we already did, that's in part one, not gonna recap it here. So as for what we think happened, uh, here's our best synopsis. The first thing is a disclaimer, we have to make some assumptions here because just like a fire in say uh, a building or a house or something like that or a forest, it's difficult to locate the original source when everything around it has been destroyed and burned up. In the case of this product, though, there was at least a clear end time when it stopped burning before it melted everything. So we can get a little more detail than, say, finding a cigarette in a forest somewhere. So this, we can say for certain, was a cascading failure. That much we know. One thing failed, and then another, and then another, and then it catastrophically failed. Now, our existing knowledge allows us to postulate that a dielectric layer broke down at the transistor level. This degradation could have been caused by excessive VSOC over an extended period of runtime, or possibly as a result of poor thermal protections in combination with high VSOC. And because this particular CPU that got analyzed came out of the same ASUS motherboard that we know to have OCP set way too high, it's possible that that was another part of this. So it all kind of ties into the original analysis, at least for this part. And it is a different part. Now, this damage sustained by a dielectric layer in the process of silicon degradation is irreversible. So once it's begun, there's no fixing it, even by lowering VSOC. At most, what you could hope for is stopping the damage or preventing it from uh, further degrading to a point of failure within the usable lifespan of the CPU. At some point, the leakage in this one may have increased local power dissipation, thus increasing leakage further. This is a vicious, inescapable cycle where it's effectively in a runaway failure scenario over an extended time initially, and then a short one at the end. After this further leakage, it's possible that the gate circuitry was hard shorted, leading it to demand yet more current that couldn't be dissipated in sufficient time. That then may have caused a meltdown near the parent dye silicon. And if we look at our sample from Skyfish, you can even see a silicon melt site that indicates temperatures again, uh, excessive enough to melt silicon. After the parent silicon meltdown, we think it's possible this particular failure bridged to nearby components and possibly knocked out power rails. With OCP failing to work on the ASUS boards. Jesus Christ, 200 Celsius. Holy sh And with the order of internal silicon components failing in what is effectively a random number generated die roll of catastrophe. <laughs> Random generated die roll of catastrophe, by the way, the name of my new D&D standalone module. We can then see the current overwhelm the circuit, crack the die, and melt open the die metals. 
At this point, the temperature is definitely in excess of 160 degrees Celsius, so the indium solder melts and fails to transfer the heat to the IHS and thus fails to transfer it to the cooler, leading to now a runaway thermal scenario, as well as our overcurrent scenario. At this point, the heat can't escape the IHS, and it's forced to go through the silicon and the substrate. We saw this in our own thermography, where the substrate was at one point hotter than the IHS due to the tim cracking and losing contact. Once the current exceeds the current carrying capacity of the substrate and the routing layers, it's possible that the trace is internally fused together and eventually blasts an escape route out of the bottom of the LGA, taking us back to the visual inspection externally. Now, that, to be very clear, is connecting a bunch of pieces of evidence of the failure to try and form a complete picture of what happened almost microsecond by microsecond within this failure to result in what we got with the earlier root cause uh, actually sort of lining up pretty cleanly with this. But there are some assumptions in there. Now, we asked our failure analyst, uh, just to give us a full scope, what other types of failure modes might there be in addition to this? And the list is very long, but here's the short version. There could be a slew of application, environment, and manufacturing defects that could have assisted in the failure of the device that we can't verify on this current device ionic contamination, corrosion, dendritic growth, intermetallics, latch-up thermal runaway, dielectric breakdown, charge trapping due to high VSOC, hot carriers and tunneling. This is starting to sound like that Rockwell retro encabulator video. It could be mechanical overstress, so thermal expansion, localized CTE mismatch, excessive pressure, tensile overload, wave for process control, like scratched, overetching, underetching, or poor ohmic contact, junction depth issues, EPI thickness, silicon stacking faults, incorrect doping pipes, trapping sites, stress-induced voids, silicon nodules, oxide defects, hot carriers, metal deposition issues, metallization adherence issues, the list goes on. A lot can go wrong. And that list was just from us asking, hey, what else can go wrong to cause this type of failure? But uh, the earlier information is what we think caused it here. So that's our best sort of analysis of the materials we have, including the root cause analysis we did previously. Extremely educational, really fun to work on. Uh, this story is mostly done at this point. We have one more piece at least that focuses though on the BIOS, the warranty issues, and ASUS being a massive scumbag of a company. But that video is less objectively focused and more focused on some of the don't be a scumbag company aspect of it. So it's the other half of our business. All right, thanks for watching as always. Go to store.cameraxis.net and grab one of these shirts because it supports this type of in-depth work directly and it's purchases from our store that have made all of this possible over the years where we can expand to buy these failed parts from people, spend the time analyzing them and really try to refine our videos to get here. So grab one on the store, they are limited. They feature the special 15 year anniversary version of our logo right on the front with a foil gold blue and there's some green in there too for GPU substrates. And otherwise, subscribe for more, or you can support us for a few bucks on patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to help there instead. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.